Well, in case you haven't noticed it, uh, we are living today in a very data-driven world. The ability to have and store enormous amounts of information, apply thousands, tens of thousands, even hundreds of thousands of very fast processors to analyze that data and manipulate it and, and, and understand it is really transforming not just computer science, which is my discipline, uh, but it's transforming biology, it's transforming forming chemistry, it's transforming physics, it's changing economics. Virtually every science and, and every academic endeavor now uh, is being changed by this ability to understand the world in a new way by applying large amounts of data and processing that information. Now, it shouldn't just be the prerogative of scientists and academics and engineers to have access to large amounts of information, to be able to visualize it, to be able to understand it, to be able to share it and educate with it. It should also be something that should be available to children, to educators, and really to every one of us, every citizen, uh, who would like to be able to, to understand what's happening in the world around them. Now, 14 years ago, in 1996, uh, one of the pioneers of modern database systems, the late Dr. Jim Gray, came into my office at Microsoft Research with a very audacious proposal. What he wanted to do was to build a multi-terabyte database and make it available to everyone on the internet, make it freely available to everyone. Now, what he was concerned about, and the reason he was coming to my office, wasn't the difficulty of the task of building such a system with the technology at that time, even though it was going to re require an enormous amount of, of computing equipment and disk drives and things of that sort, uh, just because of the technology at the time. What, what he was actually interested in talking to me about was what would be the data? I mean, what would be both voluminous enough, uh, large amounts of data, multiple terabytes, uh, and interesting enough that ordinary people would actually be interested in seeing it. And you have to remember, back then, uh, most of the estimates of, of the entire World Wide Web in 1996 had it at less than a terabyte. Right? So we're, it was both difficult to think about how much data we were going to have to bring in, and also how to make it interesting. Well, we talked about it, and we got this idea of going out and trying to find all the, the, the satellite and other kinds of imagery of the Earth's surface, bring it together in a single database, and then make that available. Now, it sounded easier when we talked about it than it was in real life, because Jim and Tom Barkley, his colleague, then had to go out to the US Geological Service. Uh, they had to fly to Moscow to visit with the Russian Space Agency and really pull together agreements to get all the information that was basically stored on dusty decks and in, in big vaults, um, and then bring it online and put it, and make, put it uh, on the system and make it available. Well, about 18 months later, at the end of 1997, the system first came up, and by the middle of 1998, we announced it, and it became broadly available to people. Uh, and the images that were available in the system at that time look, look like this. In fact, this actually is a, you can still go out to, uh, to this is now called uh, Microsoft Research Maps, but basically it is what we originally called the Terra server, uh, and it's been in continuous operation since 1998. This is, of course, the Space Needle. This was a, a U.S. Geological Service image uh, taken from 10,000 feet, uh, you know, back around 1990. You know, you can still find that data out there. Now, it wasn't just that, you know, of course, you know, ordinary people, you know, you, you give them access to this. The absolute first thing everybody I knew did when they went to this website was they looked for their own house, <laughs> right? Uh, and then they looked for their neighbors, and then they looked for their friends, you know, and then they look for famous places. In fact, we even had a feature in the old system where we just had a list of famous places because we knew everybody wanted to go visit them. Uh, well, it was great, but it wasn't just uh, making these images available that was, it was interesting to Jim. He wanted to make it avail you know, interesting as data. Um, and so we had not just the underlying images, but we had topographical information. Uh, we had um, urban data, urban planning kinds of information available. And in fact, the U.S. Department of Agri Agriculture eventually built applications uh, based on uh, this system uh, that it used to help farmers with, their, with uh, 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 planting their, uh, their fields and, uh, and supporting them in their agricultural endeavors. Now, the, 
once Jim had done the, the Earth, he then turned his eyes skyward and began working with astronomers and built something called the Sky Server. Working primarily with the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, uh, but also with astronomers and many other uh, uh, laboratories, uh, he built the Sky Server. And again, it was, his view was it was a tool for scientists. So with three lines of, of SQL, you could actually find all the quasars in the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. But it was also a tool for uh, ordinary people. And so a student could learn about the expanding universe and, and Hubble's constant and things of that sort. That transformed into something that was called the Worldwide Telescope. Um, and uh, this is, I think, work that was carried on after Jim passed away by Curtis Wong and Jonathan Fay. And what they did was to uh, build a system that gave you a full visualization of the night sky. Um, and ultimately, not just the sort of patchy view you would get by assembling all the, the information, but using uh, uh, some of the technology we developed in Microsoft Research to integrate all those images together, we were able to make a nice smooth uh, appearance um, and reduce all the, the transitions between the images. Uh, we work with NASA, and then uh, earlier this year, we brought out a, a, a similar uh, imaging of Mars. And of course, you can go out and, and look at that. Uh, but increasingly, this is used not just for imaging real things, but for visualizing information. So can I switch to the demo screen, please? I want to show you some of the things that we're doing in, in the area of visualization. So this is a visualization of the visible universe. Uh, there's one million galaxies in this image that represent all of the galaxies that, that uh, have been recorded by the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. Each point there is about 100 billion to 200 billion stars. Right? We're not just a speck here. We're not even a speck in a speck. Okay, we're a speck in a speck in a speck. Um, and I can show you this sort of, you know, three, you're basically, it's like, it's as though you were standing outside the universe looking in. Um, and that's what you're seeing. So this is the kind of thing, again, this is uh, using data, not just from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey server, but also from uh, uh, the galaxyzoo.org, uh, which is a, a, um, a crowdsourcing site. Now, there's the, Milky, there's the Milky Way, which, by the way, isn't really a spiral galaxy. It's a bar spiral galaxy. And the, the Spitzer Infrared Telescope has been able to verify that. And in fact, the central bar looks more like, is more peanut shaped than anything else. Now we're going into, uh, into our solar system. And what's interesting here is, you're going to see, that's Mars, by the way, the little red outline. As we pull away, what you're going to see is, is those two uh, blotches of yellow. Okay, those are the asteroids that are actually clustered at the Lagrange points of Jupiter uh, in, the, in the solar system. Uh, and, and by the way, in this representation, um, every object about the size of a school bus or greater is represented. Right? So it gives you a sense of, of what's possible and what's visible. Now, the, a new feature that we're just bringing online and will be available later this year uh, allows you to import data from a lot of, of other sources and to visualize it. And so here we're looking at earthquake data from the U.S. Geological Service. There are 40,000 earthquakes uh, over an 18-month period from the January of, of 2008, uh, sorry, 2009 to the middle of 2010. And what you're seeing here, those red dots, are visualizations of all of the earthquakes that happened during that 18-month period. Now we'll zip in here to uh, the, uh, that's, uh, Puerto Rico. You can see that these are, 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 are displayed in depth. Right, so you can see the earthquake shooting into the Earth's crust uh, underneath northern Puerto Rico. But you can also see, and I think I can grab this here, uh, these, this is the massive earthquakes in Haiti uh, that occurred. And one of the things you notice is that they're really close to the surface, right, which is why they were so damaging. And what you're seeing is superimposed about 50, 51 different afterquakes that occurred during that period. I'm going to quickly move over to Chile, uh, which also had its uh, a major earthquake during this period. And again, you see the power of, these, of this visualization. You're going to see a time-compressed view uh, over an 18-month period of the earthquakes uh, near Chile. 
and, and you can see that it actually it really wasn't all that incredibly active. You see a number of them, some of them uh, diving down into the, um, into the Earth's crust. And then suddenly, this massive collection of, of quakes occurred. Um, and for those of you who don't remember, uh, the quakes there were so bad, it actually changed the rotational speed of the Earth uh, and displaced, uh, for example, the, the Chilean city of uh, Concepcion by 10 feet to the west, the entire city. Um, and the last thing I'm going to show is, is really uh, a representation of some of the deepest quakes. Uh, this is in a fast abduction layer uh, north of, of uh, New Zealand. And these quakes go down as deep as 500 kilometers below the Earth's surface. So again, the point of this visualization, it, it really is demonstrating a new capability that we'll be making available online to everyone, uh, including children and educators and ordinary citizens, uh, uh, later this year. And basically, this will be a way for people to, to take advantage of all the capabilities of the Worldwide Telescope to visualize vast amounts of information. Thank you very much. Yeah.